Okay, greetings and welcome to another Village Soup feature video. Uh, we're very excited today uh, to have a very special guest here. Uh, I'm Dan Dunkel. I'm the uh, news director for Village Soup, and this is John McCafferty, and he is the sole survivor of Down East Flight 46, which crashed in Owl's Head on May 30th, 1979. And uh, you know, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. And now it's the 40th anniversary of this event. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be on that twin engine plane? You were 16 years old at the time? Yeah, I was 16 years old and I was traveling and uh, running around down south with my brother and a, and a couple friends. And uh, I decided I'd come home and uh, I flew out of Florida up to Boston and uh, we got off at 737 in Boston and and got on the uh, flight 46 in Boston and uh, I think we know what happened after that. Um, you, you had mentioned having something uh, in 2004 when we talked, you said something like a premonition before you got onto the plane? Yeah. Uh, we. We had quite a layover, and that was because of weather delay. The The plane was coming from Owl's Head down to Boston with a load of passengers. And the weather was so bad, I was supposed to have like a 45-minute delay. And it ended up being, I think, close to seven hours. And the reason for that was because the plane didn't take off from Boston and fly down because of bad weather. And yeah, when I when we finally got to board the airplane, when I walked out to the airplane, uh, you didn't have the canopy overhead like you were getting on a big airplane. You actually walked out across the tarmac and, and there was a set of stairs that came down. And um, it was raining out, so I was looking down kind of at the ground, and when I came to the plane and looked up, I just, oh, I got this uh, feeling that I would never had had before in my life, and I've never had since. And it was, I looked at that plane and I said, oh my God, this plane's going to crash. This plane is, is in, in my mind. Um, I'm thinking this. I didn't say it out loud. And I froze. And uh, as I said, it was raining out. So there was some people behind me. And uh, one one gentleman in particular kind of nudged me. And he's like, come on, let's get going. Get a move on. And against my better judgment, I got on the airplane. As I said, I never had a feeling like that. So I didn't know how to take it. I didn't, I didn't believe myself. I, it, it was just such a strange feeling that I, I ignored it. I got on the plane, but as you know, from the second I got on the plane till the time the plane crashed, I was real nervous. I, the whole flight I was, I was looking out the window, holding on to the seat in front of me a lot. It was a little bit bumpy, the turbulence and everything because of the weather that night. And I was just a nervous wreck. I tried not to show it to the other passengers. I didn't want to make anyone else nervous. And uh, yeah, my, my gut feeling was right. And so, as we were coming, you know, they came on and said that we would be landing in a few minutes, they said over the intercom, and uh, I was just focused looking out the window the whole time. So when the plane descended through the clouds, I saw the trees and I, I saw them coming up and I knew that this is it, we're going to crash. I did holler that out. And, you you uh, hollered it out to everybody? Yeah, there. I hollered it out to everybody. Were you the only person that saw it and hollered that out to anybody? I, I don't know if anybody else happened to be looking out the window. Obviously, the pilots 
saw it. And <clears throat> then they knew, of course, they were too low because I remember them pouring on full power and then trying to lift the nose of the plane. And um, anybody who knows anything about flying, it, it ended up putting the plane into what's called an air stall. And then, then it started to roll over and nose pitched down and into the woods and rocks and everything we went. Hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about, so you were at the back of the plane, right? I was actually sitting um, underneath the right hand, I was on the right hand side of the airplane and it's an overhead wing design airplane and I was right underneath the wing. So there were seats behind me and seats in front of me. Were you the rearmost passenger? Because they always no. make a point in the articles that you were somewhat towards the, the back of the plane. But Well, I was, um, I should have brought some stuff with me so you could see the layout of the plane and everything. But I forget exactly how many seats there were behind me, but I think there was, uh, another two or three seats, and then in the very rear, there was a seat that went all the way the, across the, the rear of the airplane. So that would sit like three people right in the back. And then the, and the weather conditions that you're talking about, it was rainy in Boston, and then when you got up here, as it often is this time of year, there's this blanket of fog. Uh -huh. It was basically pea soup that night. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it was real foggy. And they didn't have the visibility or the instrument instrument uh, type stuff that they have now. Now they can kind of guide by instruments. Right. I believe that there was supposed to be strobe lights on at the airport and I don't I don't think those were functioning properly. Um, can you remember how you got out of the plane and how you were able to survive? Well I survived only by the grace of God. <laughs> and uh, there was no explanation why I actually did survive. Um, the FAA contributed my survival to the good condition that I was in. I was a really healthy, um, athletic young person, uh, which that may have played a role in it somewhat. Um, but also, you can think about the fact that I was nervous and on edge and looking out the window and had a good chance to brace myself even though that really did nothing for me because the plane was just totally destroyed. Uh, so, you know, I, you can kind of factor that in. But the amount of blood that I'd lost, uh, doctors had even told me they said it's it's a miracle you lived. You just didn't have enough blood in your body to have survived. And uh, I contribute my surviving to the will of God. And why? I have no idea. I've been asked the question: uh, Does it? Do you ever ask yourself why you're the only survivor? And my reply to that is, yes, I, I wonder that all the time, but you can actually drive yourself crazy thinking about that. So only time will tell, you know. Yeah, you've had people pointedly say to you, you, you must have been saved for a reason. I've I mean, had a lot of people you know. say that, and, and often I've thought that myself, but who knows what reason, you know. I have no... Uh, I mean, I haven't done anything to save the world. I wish I could. <laughs> but, no pressure, <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, no, that's just one of those things you just don't know. And you can drive yourself crazy trying to think about why, and I've given up on that. So in the actual crash, everything was thrown to the forward, including you, and yeah. you basically, you injured your head, your, you broke an arm, broke a leg, broke a wrist, yeah. broke some ribs. Yeah. And then you either crawled or were thrown from the wreckage. I crawled. I crawled out of it. Um, 
exactly where I came out of the plane, I don't know because, as I said, the plane was in such bad condition. But <clears throat> I had to move some people off me. Yeah. And I, it was getting very dark at the time. I think it was just before 9 o'clock that the plane crashed, which was still a little bit light out. And as you said, it was really foggy that night. So the, it seems darker on a foggy night. And, uh, but I could see some light out, you know, outside. And I crawled toward that light and then kind of fell. Uh, not a long not a long distance, probably I'm going to say maybe a foot, foot and a half. So you had uh, been worried that the plane was going to explode. Yeah, I was real worried that the plane was going to explode. Um, we had taken off 300 pounds of luggage, put on 300 pounds of extra fuel. The pilot knew that he may have to divert to Augusta because he was afraid that he may not be able to land at Owl's Head because of the weather. And um, that fuel was gushing out of the plane. And when I fell from wherever, whatever hole that I came out of, it, when I fell, I, I fell right into fuel. Mm. And of course, with all the lacerations that I had, uh, the fuel was burning me. And then uh, I was able to drag myself with my left arm and left leg. And I made it about 75 yards from the, the plane. As you said, I was very scared that the plane was going to blow up. That's a long and distance, too, crawling on your belly. I mean, that's... It is. And as it's like I... like a complete nightmare scenario. Yeah, and as I crawled through, as I said, I was soaked in fuel. And then I'm crawling through all the leaves and dirt and mud and everything on the ground. So I was quite a sight when they found me. Uh, I managed to crawl. I, I crawled as far as I could. I mean, if I could have crawled further, I would have. I wanted to get as far away from that plane as I could. Uh, it was going through my mind that I'm going to burn to death. I knew I was soaked in fuel. And I knew if this thing catches fire, I'd, what a awful way that's going to be for me to die. So <clears throat> I came to uh, a low spot in the ground that, uh, and I just kind of flopped my body into it. And I, you know, I wasn't thinking totally clearly, but I thought to myself, I'm down in this low divot. So if the plane does blow, maybe the fire will blow over me. And that's where I best, came best to rest. Best you hope for yeah. at that point. Yeah. 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 And so and you were found by uh, South Thomaston ambulance personnel. I believe it was a, a Lavasser uh, who found you. Well, uh, uh, and Joanna Stadler was there with you at that yeah, time, too. Yeah. Uh, two men came in and found me. I won't mention their names right now because I don't have permission to, but uh, the two guys found me and one of them went back to where there were other people searching and he got them all together to come back to the, to the site that I was at. Um, and from the time the plane crashed to the time I actually got to the hospital, I think, was about three hours. Mm. So that so, was a long, hard yeah, process. Yeah, I think I, I was out there an hour, hour and a half before they found the plane. And then, uh, you know, after they found it, it took quite a while to get me out of the out of the woods and actually to the hospital. And they were also worried that there were other survivors that they were missing because they didn't know 
at first how many people there were because there were right. 17 other people who died on the plane. Yeah. I had actually told them that everybody else was dead, but because of the condition I was in, and they had to check, you know, you could, couldn't just go on somebody's word because I was injured so badly that I, it, by the time they found me, actually, I was going into shock. So yeah, I guess they, I guess they formed like a, uh, a search party where they were all in line, lockstep, so to speak, and, and they searched the area. When you're sitting in a hospital recovering from an event like this, what goes through your mind? Oh, a lot of things. Uh, I had a I had a priest in my family which came to the hospital, and one thing he told me, and I and I thought a lot about it. It was you. You got to be very careful what you say because you don't want to upset family members that had lost their loved ones in the crash. You, you know, so I was really concerned about how, how and what I said. I didn't want to upset anybody any more than they already were. Um, but what did I think about when I was in the hospital? Oh my God, you, <laughs> the list is long, but one of the things I was thinking about was how long am I gonna be here? When can I get out of here? I wanted to, I knew I was, I was in real bad condition, but I wanted to uh, start my own re rehabilitation as soon as I could. It's funny, back then they didn't uh, have physical therapy, I didn't do any physical therapy like you would today. You know, today you pull a muscle and they've got you in physical therapy. Back then it was... Uh, patch him up and get him out of here as quick as you can. And right. That's kind of the way that things went back then. But as far as what I thought about when I was in there, it's, it's uh, hard to say. There was a lot of things I thought about. I, d I obviously thought about the victims and, and their families and how hard it must have been on everybody. Did you ever have a chance to talk to any of the other family members or anything like that? Did they ever seek you out? To... Yeah, uh, yes I have. And as a matter of fact, uh, there's another uh, guy that I've got to call. I'll probably call him this week. Uh, I will probably call him before Thursday. Thursday's the anniversary. Uh, <clears throat> my son was recently working in, uh, down around Pennsylvania and Snapchat Somehow, I guess Snapchat, whatever location you're in, it is you get people from that area you can talk to, and and some guy uh, saw my son's name on Snapchat, and he said to my son, he said, I think that your father was the sole survivor of the plane crash that my uncle was in, and. Actually, he thinks it was his uncle that was sitting right beside me. So, <clears throat> through my son, this guy uh, said that he'd like to speak with me and, and left a phone number for me to contact him, and I, and I believe I will contact him. Uh, yeah, I've talked to a few family members, and um, I remember at the time, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, they probably hate me because I lived and, and their loved ones didn't. And that's not the case. Everybody that I've talked to has really been, uh, really been gracious to me and, and really polite. And uh, that's not the way that they feel, you know. Yeah, and I think to some extent that's like a survivor's guilt kind of maybe reaction because yeah, you know it's like you're a young person too, so I think a lot of people are kind of rooting for that young person to make it through the thing too. You know, sometimes you know. Yeah, I definitely have had and still have survivor's guilt. That's something that a lot of people wouldn't be able to understand, but uh, a lot of your people that have survived combat situations they do understand. I also have post-traumatic stress syndrome, which uh, 
I can understand guys coming back from war, why they have, why they do have it, and how it affects them. Do you still like dream about the events and, and that kind of thing, or? <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, last night, and <clears throat> very rarely does a week go by that I don't have some sort of nightmares about it. For forty years. For wow. forty years. So that's, that's a why serious fallout from it. Yeah, that's why a lot of people say when I talk to them, you know, I don't want to bring up bad memories, but you're not bringing up bad memories because, as, as I say, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about it. Hmm. What, what have you done since this? I mean, you're, uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about your life since then. You live in Searsmont and you yeah. have a son. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, well, I've spent my life as a union pipe fitter, pipe welder, and uh, now I'm retired. And I am writing a book about this, and uh, I actually, <clears throat> as I say, I'm a pipe fitter, pipe welder. I was a pipe superintendent, and the whole, the whole thing from uh, from an apprenticeship right up through to as high as you can get in the trade, and uh, so I'm not a writer, <laughs> so I'm kind of. Uh, I had a professor. I want to write, want to get a book out about this because it, uh, the story deserves to be told in full. And uh, so I'm putting a plea out to anybody who may be able to help me finish this book. I had a professor that I was working with, and he passed away. So without his support, I kind of, I, I guess it was fear of failure because I'm not a writer. And so I'm kind of stuck like halfway through the book. So if there's anybody out there that could help me, uh, I can be contacted at John McCafferty, Soul Survivor, uh, uh, gmail.com. So if- well, I'm, it, I'm sure you'll get lots of response to that. So, well, I hope so. You know. And I would like uh, to finish the book. But outside of that, uh, I've enjoyed, believe it or not, flying. Um, I love fishing. I love to play golf. Golf actually helps me with my post-traumatic stress. Anybody out there, if you have post-traumatic stress, try playing golf. <laughs> I believe a lot of warriors have, the guys that have come back from Iraq and whatnot. Uh, have tried golf and it, it seems to help them with their awesome. post-traumatic stress. That's a really helpful tip to get out there too. You know, I, I don't know yeah. if it, sometimes it doesn't cause people stress when they're trying to figure out how to get that, <laughs> get that ball to fly. Yeah, well, don't let that happen. <laughs> get out there and enjoy the game. Don't, uh, don't let it eat you up. <laughs> great, great. Well, um, thank you so much for being here today and sharing all this information with us. Well, thank you for having me. All right, great. And uh, you guys can check out all of our videos on uh, our Facebook page for Village Soup. If you just click on videos, you can check out all our archive videos. And as always, if you want to contact us, news at villagesoup.com. Thanks for watching. Thank you.